You called me from the grave by name You called me out of all my shame I see the old is past away The new has come Now morning. Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. I love, love, love this celebration so much because it really emphasizes what we are living right now. You see, on Good Friday, I preached a message titled Clothed in Love. And in that message, I explained to you that in order to be received and accepted by God, we cannot come to him in our own clothing of goodness and, and good deeds or think that he will accept us on our own terms. And we saw that when Jesus removes our sin-stained clothes and then clothes us with his red blood-dipped robe, we are then accepted by God. We then have the correct clothing to join him at the wedding feast of God. Jesus has literally clothed you in his love, his saving grace, his mercy, his righteousness. It's an amazing truth to really dig into. And I really do pray that you do that. You dig into what Jesus has done for you. 
It's all because it's such a big deal. But today, today I will continue with a similar theme by speaking to you about being clothed in power. So let's pray before we go any further. So Lord Jesus, we are so eternally grateful for what you've done. But now as it's Easter Resurrection Sunday, we get to celebrate the fact that not even death could hold you down. Not even a tomb could keep you locked in. You, Jesus, are beyond all of that. You, Jesus, are the one we celebrate today. Thank you for, for rising from dead, from death to life. Thank you for showing us what we have now. So may this time together be for your glory and for your honor as we just rest in the beautiful finished work of what you've done. It's in your name I pray, amen. Well, Resurrection Sunday is one of my favorite days because it not only celebrates our risen Lord, but it points to a life that we can have now. Yeah, it points to a life that we get to live now. And so often it's, it's, it's easy to get lost in the busyness, isn't it, of life. It's easy to get distracted by so much of what's going on around us that we get swept away by it all and we forget or even we neglect what we have in Christ, which is always far greater than anything we will ever face. Today, being Resurrection Sunday, I want to dig a little bit deeper with you as to what Jesus accomplished through his resurrection because this issue is central to our Christian faith. To start us off, I want us to consider this question because it's important that we know what Jesus actually did. So the question is this. What happened to Jesus between his burial in the tomb and his resurrection on the third day? What happened to him? Did he just lie there lifeless? The text I'm going to use, and even this topic, has been very controversial over the centuries. And some actually question if Jesus actually did what I'm about to explain to you. Did Jesus' dead body just lie there in a lifeless state until suddenly on early Sunday morning, wake up, oh, and burst out of the tomb? Or, or did he still have something else he wanted to do? If you recall at the cross, as Jesus was dying that horrible death, he declared three words, it is finished. That was the victory. That was the finished work of Christ for redemption, for redeeming mankind from the curse and the power of sin. That was the moment of victory. But now, as with every victory, a parade had to follow. You're getting this? With every victory, a parade has to follow. And we're given a hint in a very peculiar scripture found in 1 Peter 3, 18-22. Let's read it together. He writes, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water, sorry, here we go. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He's seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. Verse 19 is the one that challenged biblical scholars for centuries. This is, how it, this is what it reads in verse 19. He, Jesus, went and preached to the spirits in prison. The NIV actually renders it this way. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. What an interesting verse. Very controversial verse, but an interesting verse. It gives us insight into what Jesus was doing in those hours between the death of his body and the early Sunday morning empty tomb. My study Bible notes explain it this way. 
It says, it probably refers to Christ's proclaiming that through the event of his resurrection, the fruits of victory to the spirits in prison, which scholars, some scholars have agreed that these spirits in prison, these imprisoned spirits are demon spirits. These spirits apparently were also behind the corruption of the world in Noah's day. Now today, most scholars are in agreement. Though there's a lot of sort of interpretation, but most scholars are in, in agreement that before the resurrection, Jesus proclaimed his triumph. He declared his victory over the fallen angels. Now this would have occurred sometime between the hours of his body being placed in the tomb and the resurrection. Ephesians 4.9, Paul actually explains that before Jesus ascended in his resurrection from death, look at this. It says that he, Jesus, also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Hmm. Where did Jesus go? What is that? What, what did he do and why did he go there? In the original Greek text, this statement, the lower parts of the earth, was commonly referred to as Hades. It is the place of the dead. It is where the souls of people would be held awaiting judgment. Get this, because this is so, so awesome. According to centuries of church tradition, it's believed, oh, this is awesome, I love this. It's believed that Jesus, in the time between his burial and his appearance on Sunday morning, descended into Hades, the place of the imprisoned dead, the spirits imprisoned there. He declared and he enforced his victory and he revealed that his power is now over all rule and authority. He reclaimed the authority that Satan had stolen from Adam. And then, and then he ascended. He rose with the ultimate victory over sin, over death, over Satan and his demons once and for all. Hallelujah. Come on, you should be shouting right now because that is amazing. That's awesome. That's powerful. That's our King Jesus. Mm, that's our King Jesus. Imagine the power of his words shaking every demon to the core of their being in that moment. Imagine Jesus raising a fist of victory and proclaiming that the beginning of the end was every demon's destiny. Imagine the look of horror. <laughs> Imagine the look of horror on Satan's face and on the face of every one of his demons who thought that they had won because they killed the body of Jesus and finally in their eyes removed the threat that Jesus was to them. What a moment. Every dream of the devil shattered in one single proclamation. Oh. <laughs> Can you tell I'm a little bit excited by this? I love, love, love what Jesus has done for us. The Apostle Paul gives an awesome statement in Colossians 2 verse 15 about what the cross, this, this enforced victory and resurrection did. He said this, he says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he, Jesus, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. He made a public spectacle of them. Can you see, dear friend, the glorious victory parade that Jesus made in front of the entire demonic realm in the lower parts of the earth? Do you see our mighty king, ripping the stolen keys of authority out of Satan's hands, pulling the plug of his power and making a mockery of him in front of all that were there. It's almost like, hey devil, your reign is over. Your grip on mankind is finished. No more will you hold people hostage to your lies. No more will your deceit and your evil rule. I am the ruler. I am the king of all. I am the one who you thought was dead and is gone. Well, guess what? I'm back. <laughs> Can you see it? Maybe that's my Hollywood version of it. But Jesus, in total and complete authority and power, after his resurrection, announced his victory. Announced his victory. 
In 1 Peter 3.22, look at these awesome words. It says that Jesus has gone into heaven and he's at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So what does this mean for you and I today? Is this just a cool story? Is this just an amazing event that we need to look at from a distance and marvel and say, yep, Jesus, well done. Get this. Every demon including Satan himself, including every principality, every terrestrial spirit, every evil spirit, no longer has authority over those whom Jesus has now imparted his salvation and delegated his authority to. Jesus, seated in all authority, all dominion, all power, all glory, all majesty and victory. That Jesus, Jesus who is alive, Jesus who is ruling as king over all. That is Jesus whom we worship, whom we follow, whom we now are seated <laughs> with in heavenly places. The devil knows it. His demons know it. But do you know it? Do you know it? Is this glorious truth something that you are living from day by day? You can, because Jesus did this for you so that you can live with the blessing of what he's done. When you become a Christian, not only are your sins forgiven through the redemptive work of the cross, but now your position in life, in a very real, tangible, spiritual sense, is lived from a place of ultimate victory, power, and authority. The Apostle Paul unpacks this in Ephesians chapter 2. Please get this. Everything that Jesus accomplished through his death and resurrection, he now shares with you. The authority he fought for is now yours. The victory he died for is now yours too. The power he rose from death through is now yours too. Are you getting this? The glory of the resurrection, the ultimate pinnacle of the story of Easter is yours too. This is your story too. This truth is wonderfully explained in Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. It says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Don't miss that. Did you hear that? We also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, clothed in power. Come on, that's great news. That is great news, dear friend. Get this next statement on your screen. The resurrection of Jesus is also your resurrection. What he accomplished through his death and resurrection was not only for you, dear friend, it can now be lived through you. This can be a part of your daily life. What that means is that you can rise in the glory of Jesus' power you can, you, because you are literally clothed in resurrection power. I mean, that changes everything, doesn't it? This day should reinforce for you that you can exist in the same power that actually raised the dead body of Jesus to life. Paul writes, as, he, as we read earlier, that the power of his resurrection is something that you can know personally. This was a big deal to the early Christians, you know that? It was such a big deal to them that something got lost along the way. What happened that so many Christians today only know this by theory. What happened that we, we marvel at the early church, particularly in the book of Acts, and we read about them and we think, oh, that's amazing, but we almost see them like a different breed of people. What happened? What happened? Many have stayed at the cross. That's what happened. Many Christians... Stay at the cross, deeply thankful and in awe and amazed at their salvation. And that is great. And I, and I say, please keep on doing that. 
never lose the awe and the wonder of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. But many Christians now live on the wrong side of the cross. And I know that is, a, is probably a very controversial statement to make. They don't live beyond the initial experience of salvation. They, they don't live having now accessed the resurrection power of Jesus. Yes, please, please do not misunderstand me. Please be thankful for your salvation. Absolutely. Never stop being thankful. But, but Jesus wants us to now live in the power of his resurrection. To live in the power of his resurrection. The evidence he's looking for is a life full of the Holy Spirit. Full of power, full of authority, full of his life. Don't forget, the Bible tells us that the same power that raised Christ from death is now living and dwelling in you and I. <laughs> it literally paints a picture of God wearing you. Jesus clothing you in resurrection power of his spirit. In Acts chapter 17 verse 28, I love this, look at this. In him we live and move and have our being. Isn't that a great picture? When we get overcome by God, suddenly his being, his nature, his power infuses all that we are. Or like it puts it in the Passion Translation, it says, Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. Gee, that's good. <laughs> that, that really works for me. That is you and I being clothed by Christ. That's the breathtaking glory of what Easter Sunday is all about. We went to the cross on Friday, saved and set free. Hallelujah. And now it's resur Resurrection Sunday. We now get to live because not only did Friday happen, but Sunday showed the life beyond death. The cross beyond the grave. Let's not waste what Jesus has done for us. Let's not become complacent in accessing his power. Let's give Jesus the reward of his sacrifice. And you know this covers area every area of your life. Yes, it does. Every sickness, every disease, every trial, every issue, every aspect of, of lack and the provision you need and the blessing and the favor you want to walk in. The resurrection power of Jesus has brought us in to his kingdom, which is above all else, which has conquered all. We have already overcome the world. Hmm. So what will you do in response to the resurrection of Jesus today? Will this message simply be cast aside to an annual Easter message? Or, or will its relevance, relevance and power change the way you approach circumstances from now on? If you had a look at your life in this moment, in this moment of time, and you had a look at all the circumstances you're faced with, all of the breakthroughs you're praying for, all of the areas of your life that you'd say you need to change because of what Christ has done, can you see them? I'm sure it's not hard for you. But now I want you to ask the question, what does the resurrection life of Jesus look like when it touches every single one of those areas? areas what does the resurrection life of jesus look like when it actually collides with those areas you know you can say such things because you are clothed in the power of the one who rose from death so tell me what are the dead things in your life that need to come alive what in your world needs to collide with resurrection power and as i bring this to a close I want you to really consider what I'm talking about today. Because this cannot be cast aside to a cute little Easter message. You can't. Let's honor Jesus by living in light of all that he's done. As I bring this to a close, I want to read Romans 8 verse 11 to you. Look at this. It says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And... Just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living in you. 
Even that, that is an amazing verse. Please memorize that verse. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. Tell me. I ask you again. Where do you need the resurrection power of Jesus to collide in your life? To take authority in your life? To impact your life? But also, what can stop you from experiencing the resurrection power? Is it a mindset? Is it a lifestyle of sin or a habit of sin that you just feel is a blockage between you and accessing the best of God? Is it a, a wrong belief system that you're probably hearing what I'm saying today and thinking, Mark, none of this is relevant. No, none of this is evidenced in my life or in the life of anyone else I know. Does it even work? Is this even truth? Well, today I invite you to grab a hold of what Jesus has done and not accept anything less. Ask him to reveal it to you. Because I can try and convince you as much as you like, but not until the Holy Spirit himself brings the revelation, enlightens the eyes of your heart as is written in Scripture. As he enlightens this truth to you, I ask that you keep on pursuing him for this. You keep on digging into this and don't settle for a life that doesn't look like this. It dishonors Christ. Don't settle for simply a religious ritual or a practice and think that that's okay with God. Live on the right side of the cross. <laughs> yes, be thankful for your salvation. But now he's clothing you in power. He's clothing you in resurrection life. Will you come to Jesus and honor him with a life that is clothed in his power? Will you abandon any religious ideas or, or concepts and empty practices that are keeping you from living consumed by Holy Spirit? And before we spend time worshipping our risen Lord, let me pray. But I want to pray specifically in this moment for the power of God to fall afresh upon you. So however you best position yourself to receive, if it helps you putting your hands in front of you like this, like you're about to receive something from God, whatever, put your hands on your heart. However, whatever it works for you, I ask that we don't waste this moment. You, dear friend, are destined to be clothed in the resurrection power of Jesus. Please do not accept anything less. So let me pray. Jesus, you've done it all. I thank you, God, for proving to us, to the world, that not even death could keep you away from us. Not even death could keep you away from fulfilling the greatest sacrifice of love mankind would ever see. You've done it all, Jesus. And to think that in this moment we can walk daily in the resurrection power that brought you back to life, that to me is a truth that I want every second of every day. So I ask now in your name, that Holy Spirit, you would just clothe us, that we would feel, literally feel a, a clothing, a cloak of your presence wrap around us. <sighs> cloak of your presence wrap around us. Consume us with your power and your presence. Remind us of our authority. We want to honor you, my God with lives that live in light of what you've done. I pray this for me. I pray this for everyone watching. I pray this for my entire church family. I pray this for every son and daughter of the king across this planet, that we will be people that are refreshed, that are revived in the name of Jesus by the power that sets us apart. It's time. It's time for us to get back to what matters most i pray this in jesus name amen have an amazing easter sunday my dear friend 
I look forward to joining you next week with whatever message God's going to put on my heart. I don't even know yet. (laughs) But I'm enjoying this journey with you. Thank you so much for joining us during this Easter season. I really hope that the Good Friday message and today's Resurrection Sunday message has truly blessed your heart and just reminded you of the amazing love that we are recipients of because of Jesus. He did this. He did this. This message never gets old. I love you so much, guys. Have an amazing day. I'll see you next time.